This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website. Well, I'll start with a quote, and it's up on the PowerPoint uh, as well for those of you here in person. The proposed Key Stage 3 curriculum is unteachable and will turn students away from history. Adoption could be seriously detrimental to the future take-up of history at Key Stage 4 and beyond. Now, who do we think made this damning indictment to Michael Grove's proposed history curriculum? Was it you know, these Marxist enemies of promise that Michael Gove has recently denounced uh, in his speeches? Um, well, no, actually, uh, it wasn't uh, us. Uh, it was the Association of School and College Leaders, uh, which is an employer's uh, association, which my own head, is, along with many others, uh, is a part of. And they're not alone. Um, on the screen you'll see uh, a list, which is an incomplete list, of some of the many organisations, uh, including the Historical Association, the Royal Historical Society, History UK, uh, and many, uh, many others, including my own union, the NUT, uh, and others, who have uh, really profound criticisms of the, camp- uh, of the curriculum that's been proposed. And it's for that reason that um, myself and others, including Phil, who's with us here, um, have helped set up the Defence School History Campaign in opposition to these plans. Um, this, uh, these are some students who went to a meeting of the Black and uh, Asian Studies Association, um, a very good meeting in opposition to the plans. And we had a, a number of students at our seminar as well uh, a couple of weeks ago. And... Of over uh, 1,600 teachers surveyed by the Historical Association, just 4% thought that the proposed curriculum was a positive change. So, what are the key problems with it? I can agree with one comment that Michael Gove made recently, not many, but this one at least. There is no part of the national curriculum so likely to prove an ideological battleground for contending armies as history. And, of course, there has been uh, an awful lot written about this in the press and a fair bit of uh, airtime as well. And, you know, obviously us historians are an argumentative bunch, and I'm sure that's a part of it. By necessity, therefore, this will be a fairly superficial survey of all of those debates, um, much like the proposed curriculum framework, in fact, which is itself very superficial in meaningful ways, even though very detailed. So the points I'd like to focus on are the ones uh, on your screen there. Uh, Content overload, sequential teaching, pedagogy, imperial nostalgia, and consultation. Uh, and then rounding up with questioning what Michael Gove is up to and how we stop him. So, content overload. Before I go into this, just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, the school key stages, as they're now known. Um, key stage one is what we called infant school when I was uh, younger, five to seven-year-olds, or years one and two. Key stage two is the juniors, so up till 11, that's years three to six. Then in the secondary, uh, we're key stage three, ages 11 to 14, although some schools now condense that into two years, but it should in theory be years seven to nine. And then key stage four, when most students do GCSEs or level two BTECs, uh, 14 to 16, years 10 to 11. So 96% of teachers uh, surveyed by the Historical Association think the curriculum is too prescriptive. There are some 128 bullet points of required content listed in the draft, as well as 68 historical figures. Uh, this is for students between 5 and 14, or as I mentioned, some students will only go up to 13 with compulsory um, history teaching, after which they go into Key Stage 4. Um, and as you'll see from your handouts, many of these topics on their own could occupy a professional historian for their entire career. Um, so you've got a copy of the, the proposed curriculum here, which lists all the relevant bullet points. Um, it's, of course, one of the challenges of any school history teacher to engage in a simplification without making history simplistic, um, to teach a broad range of topics which collectively develop a meaningful method. But to achieve this breadth, you need to have depth studies, which go beyond that overview and interrogate the complexity of the past in particular instances. So what are the chances of this with Gove's curriculum? Well, key stage one includes the requirement to teach about local, national and global events, key individuals, concepts and vocabulary. Uh, Concepts and vocabulary I'll return to later. The ambition of local, national and global, I think, 
it's ambitious, but it's not problematic in and of itself um, if teachers are able to uh, do it in creative uh, and appropriate ways. But key stage two, seven to 11 year olds, I think is another matter. Here we start with some ancient Greek and Roman civilization. Then we have an extraordinary rush through the ages from Stone Age settlements to the 1707 Act of the Union. 93% of respondents to the Historical Association survey strongly disagree that everything from the Stone Age to the start of the 18th century should be taught at primary. Although the preamble to the curriculum says pupils should be made aware that history takes many forms, including cultural, economic, military, political, religious and social history, it's not clear that the list they provide actually does so. The political and the military aspects seem to conquer all the others. Now, the vast majority of primary teachers aren't specialist history teachers. Uh, and indeed, Ofsted's national advisor, Lezek Arasko, uh, apologies if I've pronounced that wrong, uh, Lezek, says that 28% of key stage three history teaching, that's secondary history teaching, isn't performed by specialists either. Apart from the history subjects leaders that exist in some primary schools, uh, the primary teachers I've spoken to received at best a few hours of subject-specific training um, before they began, and rarely afterwards. How they can reasonably be expected, therefore, to command a detailed knowledge of tens of thousands of years of human history, alongside every other curriculum subject they teach, is beyond me. And how long will they have to develop this encyc encyclopaedic account? Well, the QCA recommends 4% of curriculum time be devoted to history across key stages 1 and 2. Even if this doesn't get squeezed by cramming for the counterproductive tests that the government imposes, like uh, for phonics, for SPAG, that's spelling, um, punctuation, grammar, uh, and SATs, even if that it doesn't take away from it, this amounts to a total of 192 hours in six years, or 132 hours for the post-infant rush through the ages. So all being well, barring tests, snow days, local elections, teacher illness, etc., and assuming we're only covering the Stone Age since the ice sheet melted, which isn't made clear, students will cover about 60 years per hour, which is almost fast enough to be a Lib Dem Energy and Climate Change Minister. The Key Stage 3 curriculum is a mere three centuries, but equally densely packed. Here the QCA's guidance is for 5% timetable time, or 45 hours per year. But there's wide variation uh, in what actually happens. In my last school, for example, we didn't have um, specific history in, in year seven, the first year. Uh, we had integrated humanities. And that had many benefits, um, but content quantity wasn't one of them. I know of schools that teach as little as 50 minutes per week of history and a condensed two-year key stage three, which works out at just 65 hours for pages seven, eight, and nine of the documents in front of you. And obviously that includes tests. So, sequential teaching, and illustrated here by, of course, a picture from the History Boys. Um, there's an unsustainable assumption made by Gove and his supporters that sequential teaching is synonymous with chronological understanding. But as Richard Evans wrote in the New Statesman recently, given the time available, the chronology, the chronology will end up being taught as discrete episodes. Narrative, or to use a better word, chronicle, the recital of one event after another, will not help children understand change over time. To do that, they need to compare and relate events with each other and with their context, not just to learn that the Vikings came after the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans after the Vikings. In practice, sequ sequential teaching of this kind does not provide a context. It rips events out of their context, leaving them insusceptible to analysis. Now, a consequence uh, for adopting this one damn thing after another approach, see what I did there, is that ancient to medieval history will be taught exclusively by non-specialist primary teachers to students at an early stage of development. And I think this will reinforce the Whiggish prejudice that these periods and their people are less complex and less worthy of detailed study. How meaningfully can a, year, uh, sorry, can a seven-year-old grasp the evidential challenges of reconstruction, reconstructing ancient societies from scarce sources? Currently, this difficulty is mitigated by returning to some periods at a later date when students have developed greater historical skills. So, for example, many primaries do projects on Victorians or World War II life, which can lay a foundation for deep learning in secondary schools. But no longer will primary teachers be encouraged to teach these topics, and it seems unlikely, given the amount of content, they'll do a bit extra. They will somehow have to resource a huge range of new topics with no money or extra time for curriculum planning. 
And how many ancient or medieval specialists would want to go into history teaching when they're unlikely to get a chance to teach their periods? So, pedagogy. The current curriculum has a series of level descriptions. This has often been used mechanically to support a crude agenda of constantly grading students, which leads to the soul-destroying conversations amongst teachers about children being 4Cs or 4Bs. It also imposes a view of learning as linear and easily measurable, which, when often actually, it's driven by periods of consolidation punctuated by breakthroughs. However, at least it provides a model, however flawed, of how historical learning might improve. There's no such advice for either Key Stage 1 or 2 in this proposal. The preambles there are all about content. There are some very generalised aims for Key Stage 3, but no guidance about how, for example, students might use historical concepts in increasingly sophisticated ways. Now, I'm all for trusting teachers, but also for sharing research and good practice. This seems to me to have been airbrushed from school history. Likewise, experience of child development seems to have gone out of the window with these age-inappropriate requirements. When I taught Year 8, some students struggled with concepts such as Parliament. It's an institution, it's got two chambers, it's a complex of buildings. So how are five-year-olds meant to grasp this concept? Or, for that matter, civilization, monarchy or democracy in a meaningful way? A child may be able to power it to definition, this doesn't mean they can apply it, so let's learn question it. Content overload will also make creative teaching and learning extremely difficult. Gove and Starkey have been at pains to perpetuate what Christine Council of the Historical Association long ago showed was a distracting dichotomy between skills and knowledge. Of course, they're dialectically, li dialectically linked, with meaningful inquiries developed around um, and towards discovering evidence conclusions. Gove instead wants a pub quiz primer, encouraging didactic teaching that pours facts into empty vessel students. He then caricatures his opponents, who have more ambition, who have seen through experience that learning is most effective when it is active. Now I'm hoping that if I click on this link, we'll get an idea of an example of what not to do, provided very helpfully for us by the Secretary of State for Education. Thank you, boys and girls. It's a pleasure to be here in Lewisham, the Cabinet National Satisfaction College. Happy New Year to you all. Um, and my sympathies to those of you in Year 6 whose lessons I've observed and who now, I suppose as a form of punishment, have to listen to me. Schools are continually finding new ways to work together and to support each other. There are 403 converter academies in approximately 138 chains. And these chains range from multi academy trusts which share. Five schools are expected to join by April. Now, the academies in this trust all work collaboratively. They share training and the development of staff. They work together on curriculum design. And they use shared administrative and financial management services. And the schools are all seeing the benefits, with the results rising and vast improvements being made. Two of the schools in the trust, Depton Park and Welling, were among the most improved in the country. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you get the idea. and. You know, as someone who has been observed to death like most teachers, if it wasn't Michael Gove, I might have an element of sympathy, but it is, so I don't. Um, require an improvement, Michael. Gove's recent straw men were a couple of activities he found on history teaching websites. Uh, let's leave aside the point that um, I would make to my students about the dangers of overgeneralising from isolated examples. Uh, one of them was a revision activity encouraging students to summarise the rise of Hitler as a Mr. Men story for younger students. Now, whatever the merits of this particular example, the aims of transforming knowledge into a new form and of putting the students into the position of a teacher are effective and well-established strategies. Another example was an article in Primary History magazine where students were asked to analyse King John as a cowardly lion in Disney's Robin Hood. Gove thinks this is infantil... Inf I can never say this word. Infantilising. Uh, but unpicking media representations, particularly when they're bound up with historical assessments, is a high-level skill which will serve students well in the future. Either Gove can't see this because he can't get past the superficial facts that a cartoon is being used, or he can and deliberately wants to denigrate history's potential to create critical questioning media literate citizens. It's exactly that kind of citizen who's today's embarrassed Gove for his cavalier use of evidence to damn the supposed ignorance of our students. Retired teacher Janet Downs put in a Freedom of Information request asking Gove to prove his claim in the Daily Mail that survey after survey 
has revealed disturbing historical ignorance, with one teacher in five believing Winston Churchill was a fictional character, while 58% think Sherlock Holmes was real. In fact, this evidence was based on promotional research by UK TV Gold and backed up by similarly re reliable claims from Premier Inn, which used its research to suggest historical ignorance was something that can be rectified by visiting all the fantastic landmarks and places of interest in the, that the UK has to offer. No doubt, close to a Premier Inn. None of the research met the standards of the Polling Council, or indeed the current or proposed history curriculum. Uh, the current one says students should learn to evaluate the sources used in order to reach reasoned conclusions, whilst the draft curriculum notes students should understand how evidence is used rigorously to make historical claims. So, Imperial Nostalgia, and 1066 and all that. Goes initial aim that all pupils know and understand the story of these islands, how the British people shaped this nation and how Britain influenced the world. Well, there's a very clear message from the outset there, isn't there, that this will be an insta-self-absorbed narrative and the rest of the world will only be a passive object to be acted upon, never a subject in its own right. To give one example, the role of Islamic civilizations, which is currently studied in many secondary schools, in transmitting and developing ancient learning, laying the foundation for the European Renaissance, is absent. Also now excluded are the ancient Egyptians, currently a popular primary topic. Africans now only enter the curriculum explicitly in order to be enslaved. Migration appears to begin with the Empire Windrush. There's no mention of the millions of Indians and Caribbean soldiers in the two world wars, or any modern anti-racist movements. This is, as many have commented, both a very detailed and a very narrow account. It's triumphalist about Britain's heroes, describing the colonisation of the subcontinent as Clive of India, and naming five Enlightenment thinkers in England, including honorary Englishman Adam Smith, but not Voltaire or, or Rousseau. It's history through the nostalgic prism of empire. As Richard Evans says, Goves is a Little England version of our national past linked to an isolationist view of our national future. Even some of Goves' natural bedfellows have expressed concern about this. One of his consultants, Steve Mastin, a history teacher and failed Tory candidate at the last election, said, As far as I'm aware, we will be the only jurisdiction in the Western world that won't teach world history. Which brings us to consultation, or the lack thereof. Mastin suggests that between January when he was being consulted, and the publication of this document, which no one involved in the consultation had seen, someone has typed it up and I have no idea who that is. There is a credible, if unsubstantiated, rumour that Gove took it home for the weekend and rewrote it himself. Certainly there's little evidence of teachers' participation. It bears no resemblance to the discussion at the consultation meeting I uh, attended, hosted by Simon Sharma at the Institute of Education, and 96% of secretary teachers surveyed by the Historical Association believe that they've been insufficiently listened to. And even the pretense of consultation has been ignored where students are concerned. Not a single one was approached by the government's call for evidence. So can we expect the overwhelming criticism of the cu curriculum draft to lead to meaningful revisions? Education correspondent Warwick Mantle was asked if we could be about to see a major U-turn based on a speech given by Gove to the National College for Teaching and Leadership. He suggested that all schools can ask to disapply and any aspect of the national curriculum if they feel they can do something better and more appropriate for their children. Of course, if you're an academy, as around half of secondaries currently are, you don't even have to make this request. You can, in theory, just ignore the curriculum. And he opines that, I think this national curriculum may well be the last national curriculum, because in future, teachers will be doing it for themselves. And curriculum form wasn't even mentioned in the department's midterm review. All of which is a bit puzzling, because if Gove is that relaxed about schools not following his curriculum, why has he picked a fight over it? A likely answer is that he knew there was political capital to be gained from doing so, not with teachers or students, but with the Tory right, who he hopes will propel him, as they did his heroine Margaret Thatcher before him, from the Education Ministry to party leader. Tristram Hunt suggests that the battle over its Anglocentrism may be designed to rally the Eurosceptic right um, for a no vote in a future EU referendum. The level of central control suggested by national curriculum does seem to contradict the Tory principles of deregulation. But this is equally true of academisation, which takes authority from local educational authorities only to centralise it at the Department for Education. 
One possibility is that Gove has made it deliberately unpalatable to encourage the remaining LEA schools to convert to being academies. But we shouldn't rule out the likelihood that he's so ideologically blinkered that he really thinks this is what our children need. The danger uh, is not that teachers will be convinced by this, but that they will get lulled into a full sense of security. Since, since the national curriculum was first introduced 25 years ago, history teachers have become very good at manipulating and subverting the worst aspects of it. Indeed, the uh, HA survey suggested that only 7% thought that their school would follow the new history curriculum and the company proposed content closely. But we've yet to hear details that could make that very difficult. Details of assessment arrangements. So will end of Key Stage 3 or new GCSE assessments depend on a thorough teaching of this curriculum? And will offset grade schools according to how closely it's followed? And will performance rated pay be linked to these measures? If the answer to these questions is yes, we could see academies opting in rather than LEA schools opting out. So it would be unwise to be complacent. That's why the Defence School History Campaign will organise further meetings and a conference while we're planning a pamphlet, while we're working with MPs to get an EDM and to lobby the Education Select Committee, and also why, if needed, we'll try to convince teachers, students and parents of the need to collectively disapply the new curriculum, whether the Department for Education gives its permission or not. Because as George Orwell famously pointed out, who controls the past controls the future, and we can't afford Gove controlling either.